My name is Mel Robbins. I work for CNN, and I also am the CEO of Shrewd Media, which is based here in Boston, and we are one of the largest publishers online for women 30 plus. We've been in business for about six months and are doing uh, 1.8 million uniques a month, uh, to just aggregating content. And so what I want to talk to you about and what I talk to audiences about all over the world is your brain and the ways in which you screw yourself over. And what this speech is based on is a TED talk that I gave about two years ago in San Francisco that has since gone viral. And one of the things that, that um, we thought would be an interesting subject for us to talk about is managing complexity. Because the truth of the matter is, life is extremely complex. You work in a very complex industry, and it's only going to get worse. And so the question becomes, how the hell do you manage complexity without making things so complicated? And this is what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to talk about three stories in the news that you all know. None of them are Ebola. I'm so sick of talking about that. I feel like CNN should be rebranded ENN, the Ebola News Network. And I don't think we're going to come off of this until there's some sort of plane disaster or some other tr terrible tragedy. I mean, that's one of the bad things about being in the news business. But we're not going to talk about Ebola. We're going to talk about three examples of where there was a very complex situation that happened in the news and how an individual handled it. Okay. Then what we're going to get into is research from the Harvard Business School and from a number of neuroscientists scientists about the ways in which you should organize your workday so that you can be extremely effective. Because before I was in the media business, I was an attorney and I ran an executive coaching practice and I was on retainer with uh, A.G. Edwards, now Wells Fargo. I was on retainer with Bank of America with a bunch of different hedge funds. And so I understand the kind of constraints that you all feel in terms of the industries that you work in. And one of the major complaints that all of my clients had is that by the time they walked through the door of the office with a huge plan in place to execute for the day, and right before the bell went off, the shit hit the fan and their day was gone and they never felt like they were in control of their day. So I'm going to show you the science behind how to organize your day so that you're more effective. And then I'm going to pull back the curtain and explain that even though you know all this stuff, you are not going to follow it. And the reason why is your brain screws you over all day long. And then I'm going to teach you what to do about it. So let's get started. All right, remember this guy? Yeah, this was a very, very complex story because it involved so many different owners. It involved the uh, NBA bylaws. It involved racism. It involved public opinion. It involved a potential player walkout. It involved sponsors leaving. I mean, this is a complete moving target. Well, luckily, Adam Silver gave us all a lesson in how you manage a complex issue. There's only two rules. They're very simple. Where do you stand and what's the outcome? And Adam Silver gave a press conference and I actually printed it out because I wanted to make sure I got the language right, where he said some things that you knew, whether you agreed with him or not, exactly what the NBA stood for, correct? You knew racism not tolerated. This guy, out. Fine. He was so clear. And the reason why he could be clear is because Adam Silver knew what he stood for, and he knew the outcome that he wanted. And what he stood for, he said to you. He basically said, uh, I'm personally distraught that the views expressed by Mr. Sterling came from an institution that has historically taken such a leadership role in matters of race relations. So he sees the NBA as a leader in race relations. And you know what the outcome he wanted? He said it very, very clear. As for Mr. Sterling's ownership in the Clippers, I urge the Board of Governors to exercise its authority to force a sale of the team. And I will do everything in my power to make sure that happens. And so whether you agree with him or not, this is a very simple example of the fact that when it comes to complexity, you're never going to change how complex 
any issue is, whether it's complexity at work, complexity with technology, complexity with regulation, complexity with HR issues, complexity with your schedule, complexity with your sex life, like whatever the complexity is. You're never going to change the complexity. All you can do is be powerful as an individual in what you're going to do about it. Let's look at another example. Oh, yeah, you remember this one, right? Everybody knows, Ray Rice, elevator. I know it's a little blurry. Too bad TMZ wasn't actually there, because then you'd have really close footage. And let's contrast Adam Silver against this guy. Now, can I see by a show of hands how many people who know right now what is the policy if, say, somebody gets arrested for domestic violence? Can you raise your hand if you know exactly what the NFL is going to do? Not one? I'll tell you why. You know. What are they going to do? Nothing. Well, that didn't happen with Greg Hardy right after they passed that. We weren't quite sure what happened with Adrian Peterson when they passed that. Not quite sure. I mean, so, so you're right. That's what the rules are. And in fact, that's what the rules were when he found out what happened with Ray Rice. And he didn't even do that kind of suspension. He went for the full throttle on him. Now, here's what's interesting about Goodell. It's a complex situation, because domestic violence is really complex, lots of psychological issues. You almost never prosecute those kind of cases, because the victims typically recant for a number of reasons. And I personally think the NFL has no business getting involved in them, which is why they need to have a very clear policy for complex situations. In fact, you did a much better job. What's your name, sir? Seifel. Seifel did a much better job than Goodell did. Because the Seifel basically said, yes, fist pump Seifel there. Because um, <laughs> the Seifel basically, is Goodell had stood up and said, from here on out, here's what we're doing. You get arrested, six games you're out. You're still going to get paid, so you can stop whining about it right now. You get arrested a second time, you're out for the year. In fact, you're out for good, but you can, you can appeal it. If he did that, everybody would know where they stand. The fact is, he stood up there and he was like, oh, OK, I'm going to say this sentence and that sentence, and hopefully 45 minutes will pass by. He basically said this, I'm not satisfied with the way we handled it from the get-go. I made a mistake. We are taking a number of steps. We will re-examine, enhance, and improve. There will be changes to our current policy. I know this because we will make it happen. We've acknowledged that we need to change. Now we just need to get to what those changes are. And you know when they're going to announce the changes, by the way? after the Super Bowl. I mean, isn't that so convenient? So this is an example of when you're not clear about where you stand, when you're not clear about what your outcome is. You create more complexity. Everybody's confused about what the NFL is going to do because he didn't say what they were going to do. This is another thing. Complex situations should never be solved with your gut. Because you need to use your head to think through it. You need to use your head to basically say, what do I want, and what's the outcome here? Let me give you one more in a corporate setting before we move on to you and what you're doing to screw yourself up. So let's talk about Starbucks. Starbucks in 2008, um, very interesting thing happened. And many of you, if you were in the financial services market then, probably know this, that their net income decreased by about 28% that year. And at the time, they had 16,000 stores in 44 countries, and they had gone through this massive explosive growth segment in terms of going from going public in, I think it was like 1992, they only had 125 stores, and now here we are, 2008, they've got 16,000. So what ends up happening is Howard Schultz, who was the chairman of the board, comes back in as the CEO. Very complex situation, right? You've got operations in 44 countries. You've got massive reduction in terms of the profits that you have. You've got the stock market and Wall Street screaming at you. You've got customers that are going to Dunkin' Donuts because there's a recession that's hitting. So what do you do? Well, he was very clear, again, back to the two rules. What do I stand for? Like, what, is it, what, is, what am I doing? And what do I want the outcome to be? So he was very clear that what he stood for as a leader and what Starbucks should stand for is the Starbucks experience. He wanted to go back to the beginning and 
reintroduce people to the romance of having a cup of coffee. Because you know, that's how Starbucks launched in the beginning, that he was traveling and was over in Italy and was like, God, why don't we have places like these great stops to have a little cup of coffee over in the United States? Boom, Starbucks, an idea, it's born, it's launched. So he decides he's gonna do whatever he can to get the romance of having a cup of coffee back. The other thing that he said is that they were going to build on their legacy of innovation. So what did he do? It's pretty interesting because in one year, they grew sales by 4% and because of the amount of innovative cost cuttings, they hired a guy that was part of the Toyota Lean uh, management initiative, they were able to do a whopping 200% rise in profits in a matter of just over a year. And I'm sure there were people in this room that capitalized on it, but what's more interesting is how did he do it? Well, one of the things that he did is he looked at costs and was very innovative around costs. The other thing that he did is he closed a thousand of the worst performing stores and he started something that we're still seeing happen. He decided instead of being the kind of chain feel, because it was starting to backfire from a PR perspective and it doesn't really give you the romance of a cup of coffee, every single Starbucks you go into now is totally different than the one just down the road. Because he wanted to go back to it feeling like a local coffee shop and it feeling like a nice break in your day. They got rid of all those teddy bears and all the musical crap that was cluttering up the stuff. They got better food and he kept the healthcare policy because that was part of the Starbucks experience and in innovating. Very interesting because it comes back to you. What can you learn from these three examples? And what you can learn is this. In life, in any situation, whether you're talking about growing your company, growing your bank account, getting in a relationship, getting out of a relationship, getting something done at the school system that your kids are going to on behalf of your kids, whatever it is that you're up to in life, this is the only question that you need to ask yourself. Well, what is it that I want? Because the truth of the matter is, if you can answer that, you can have it. And the reason why you can have it is because these two things. I guarantee you for anything that you wanna do, whether it's make more money, get home earlier so that you can spend more time with your family, get rid of the person that you're with, lose weight, get in shape, whatever it is, you can do it. I'm gonna prove it to you. How many people in here would like to raise your hand if you'd like to lose weight or get in much better shape than you are right now. Come on, get it up, let's go. I'm gonna turn the lights on you people. Um, okay, great, leave your hand raised if you know exactly what you're supposed to be doing to get that. See, you know what to do and you're capable of doing it. You just don't want to. This is where the brain comes in. And you're gonna find that this is true about everything. Everything that you want to do, that you want to accomplish, all those dreams that you have, all those financial goals that you have, all those business goals that you have, they are totally within your reach. And the only thing that is going to prevent you from getting them is the dumb crap that's in your head. And I'm going to show you what that means. And here's something that's also really cool. I want you to understand a little bit of context because things have changed radically in the last 10 years. Not only do you have the information that you need to do anything. Because anything that you wanna do, whether it's make more money, whether it's build your own algorithm and sell it for millions of dollars, whether it is to get a divorce, whether it's to write a book, whatever it may be that's on your mind that you wanna accomplish, somebody else has already done it, they're probably blogging about it, or there's a couple dozen bestsellers that you can read and you'll get step-by-step -step instructions. You can also stalk people online that have done it. You can look at their Twitter feeds. You can check out their LinkedIn profiles. You can read the Business Insider articles that are about them that talk all about the way that their business was launched. There's the technology that helps you do the kinds of things you couldn't do 10 years ago. And there's also social acceptance. And so it is absolutely true, I am 100% convinced, that if you decide there's something that you want to accomplish, you have everything you could possibly need to get it done. The only thing is you will stop yourself every single step of the way, and it's total bullshit. And let me tell you something. Um, scientists have crunched the numbers on the odds of you being born. And if anyone knows this statistic, do not shout it out, because we're gonna find somebody. Um, and by crunching the numbers and the odds of you being born, they mean they went through the entire history of the world and took into account all of the natural disasters, all of the wars, all of the famines, everything. 
and they calculated the odds of you being born to the parents that you got on the day that you were born with the DNA structure that you have. What do you suppose those odds are? Dante, stand up. Can you guys give him a round of applause? Because he's like, oh, God, <laughs> not me. They're like, thank God it's him and not me. OK, so what do you think the odds are? What's your birthday? Year July. July? July 28th, 71. I'm older than you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> July 28th, 1971. What do you think the odds are? What are your parents' names? What are their names? Uh -huh. Dorothy and Claude. Dorothy and Claude, very nice. So what do you think the odds are, Dante, of you being born to Dorothy and Claude on the day that you were born with the DNA structure that you got, given the entire history of the world? Chillion the one. Nope. That's one in 400 trillion, right? Mm -hmm. You're better at numbers than I am. Yes. yes. You know what that means? I'm a very lucky person. You're a miracle. <laughs> like, you know what? What it means is all those things that you have cooking inside you telling you, you know, I should do this. I should really do that. You know, I should. <laughs> That's not. Those, it's, they're saying that. Like, your, your insides are saying that because you're supposed to do it. It's that part of you that's talking to you. And it's never going to go away. And that's true for all of you, by the way. Those annoyings I should, those things that you keep thinking about, you keep thinking about them because you're supposed to do something about it. Thank you. Then give him a round of applause, please. Um, because the truth of the matter is that getting what you want is actually really simple. But notice I didn't say it was easy. And earlier I was talking about getting in shape or, or losing weight. And it's actually pretty simple, right? You pick a freaking program and you follow it. Any diet will work. The problem is you alter it. Any exercise program will work. The problem is you don't do it. That's what makes it hard. And that's true about everything in life. It comes down to knowing what you want and then making a plan. And then the real hard part, which is sticking to it. And I know you don't have time to do any of this stuff. And I'm going to start by explaining to you what the best practices are, and in particular, the best practices for this industry. And then I'm going to explain to you how your brain works and why the only thing that's standing between you and having whatever it is that you want and being more effective and making more money and being happier is your head. And not your head in terms of your thoughts. It's your head in terms of how it's wired and how living in modern life is screwing it up. So first of all, this is scientifically, based on all this research, so the Harvard Business School published a study where they took a look at several dozen CEOs around the planet that are billionaires and also happen to be happy. And they found something very interesting, that they all had something very interesting in common. And what they had in common was how they structured their day. And the most important thing about being effective at work and feeling in control which are vital to you doing and achieving what you want is how you start your day. And almost every single one of these CEOs said that they had a morning ritual where they spent 30 to 90 minutes working at home, developing a plan and setting up what they were going to do before they went to work. And the reason why is you know exactly why. The second you walk in the door at work, your day is hijacked. You're interrupted. It's a place of distraction. In fact, it's probably the place where you get the least amount of work done. But at least that way, they found that when they got to work, they already had gotten out of the way the strategic things that they needed to think about. The other thing that's interesting is you should never have meetings in the morning, ever. You should never do people stuff in the morning. You shouldn't have phone calls in the morning. And here's why. Because in terms of how the brain works, you have about a two and a half hour window after you wake up. So you've got about a half an hour. You wake up, then you've got a half an hour of time where you're kind of getting awake and kind of coming into the day, and your brain is almost starting to turn on. And then you've got a two and a half hour window where you can do your best thinking and the highest level of processing. 
And so what you want to do is you want to reserve the mornings in terms of how you block out your time. And I realize a lot of you are sitting in front of monitors all day and checking out CNBC and looking at alerts and looking at research and everything else. But for crying out loud, the morning time, there, you should not be in meetings, ever. You need to make sure those are scheduled in the afternoon. You need to make sure people things are scheduled in the afternoon because you will naturally dip also at two instead of having a Diet Coke or a 15th cup of coffee. If you're in a meeting, the energy of the other people will actually wake you up. And then the final thing that they said that was really interesting is almost all of them try to have a relaxing evening because you cannot power through 23 hours a day and be effective. It's impossible. In fact, if you don't get enough sleep, They've, they've tested this out, and if you don't get the amount of sleep that you need, which is between seven and eight hours, let's say repeatedly in a row you get five hours of sleep in three days, just five hours, three days in a row, legally you act in terms of a cognitive fashion as if you're legally drunk. It affects your processing that much. I know you guys are like, I don't care. Okay. <laughs> this is how the average person spends their day. 28% of your time reading and answering freaking email. Do you know 83% of your work years, 80, excuse me, 83 days a year at work, you know what you're doing? Email. It's unbelievable. And most of you spend too much time responding to emails. And the best philosophy for email, and almost nobody follows it, is if it requires more than one or two sentences to respond, flag it and save it for later. Save it for the afternoon where you do the people stuff, okay? So let's talk about your morning routine. What's the first thing that you did this morning? Shower. Hit the snooze. It's true. The majority of people hit the snooze alarm. Now, I don't have some big agenda for you to get up early, but I do want you to do something tomorrow. I want you to set your alarm a half an hour earlier. I know you're like, oh, they've got an open bar with free alcohol tonight. <laughs> this chick is out of her mind. I'm not doing it. No, I want you to set your alarm for a half an hour earlier. And the reason why is I want you to do a little neurological test with yourself. You're going to set the alarm for a half an hour earlier. When that alarm goes off, many of you are staying in a hotel room, and so you're going to be all cozy, and there's no kids or pets or partners or anybody else in that bed, and you're going to want to sleep in. What you're going to do instead is you're going to throw the sheets off, and you're gonna stand up in that cold hotel room and you're gonna to walk toward the bathroom. And the whole time you're gonna be like, I hate that freaking woman that was talking yesterday and why am I doing this? Because she's not here. And the reason why I'm asking you to do that is because I want you to understand what scientists call activation energy. Activation energy is the physical force that is required to get you to do something different than what your body's already doing. So it's the same amount of energy that it takes, for example, if you're sitting at the computer and you know you gotta go to the gym, the same amount of energy that's required to force your ass out of bed 30 minutes earlier instead of hitting the snooze is the exact same amount of energy that you're gonna need to force yourself to get up from the computer, to force yourself to put down the croissant if you're on a diet, to force yourself to have the tough conversation that you've been avoiding with your boss. And I want you to come and, come and do this experiment because you're gonna become face to face with what a complete stubborn jerk you are. And you resist yourself all day long. You do. What's the next thing you did? Let's see, first you hit the snooze. I know I didn't realize it were a big slip, but we're gonna do this anyway. 73% of you sleep within reach of the phone. Or not 73, 83, okay? It's probably even higher at this stage. And if you think about it, if you're in bed and you got your phone over here and the alarm goes off and you're like grabbing for it and then you get it and then you do this. So here you are, it's seven o'clock in the morning. You're not even freaking vertical and you're already checking emails. And by the way, what is an email? Other people's shit. Email is the way that everybody assigns you stuff. It's other people's to-do list. And so you're not even out of bed yet, and your brain is already processing everybody else's garbage. This is the worst way that you could start your day. And if those of you, if there are those of you that wake up, and I know there are in this room, and you already feel overwhelmed, and you already have anxiety, and you already feel like, oh my God, I'm not gonna get everything done, you're right. 
because everything that was on this phone, whether it's the sale at Zappos or the update from Team Street on Beach, Bleacher Report or something else, is already in your brain. It just went in queue ahead of what you were supposed to do. Remember those CEOs that I was telling you about and how they plan their morning? Their morning ritual does not start with this. Their morning ritual starts with figuring out what are my priorities for the day and taking 30 flipping minutes to use some higher processing to get it done. So what you should do is you should take that phone, and I'm going to use it as my alarm clock. No problem. Put it in the bathroom. That way, when it goes off, you have to get up. And by the time you walk to the bathroom, you're up. And they've also done all this research, by the way, that as this thing is on at night, even if you've got it on vibrate, it's going to be interrupting your deep sleep. Even if you've got it on silent, the blue light that comes on has been proven to interfere with the neural pathways that you actually need to be relaxing. It stimulates them and has them go like, oh, okay, I gotta be paying attention to something. And you should never let your kids do it. Here's another interesting little uh, experiment that happened. It's really important, you know how we were talking about that we live in complex environments and you in particular working in financial services live in very complex environments. And so one of the important things is, is yes, you gotta know what do I want, and what are the two things? Anyone remember? What do I stand for? What do I want? That was a test. Um, the other thing is you can do certain things to control your environment, OK? To make it easier for you to be effective. They have proven that distractions that interrupt your flow at work make you stupid. There was a study that was done in Chicago at the University of Chicago where they took a look at these two classrooms and they couldn't kind of figure out what was going on because it was two fourth grade classrooms. And one of them was on the right side of the hall, the other was on the left side of the hall, and yet every single year, the classroom and the left side of the hall, an entire year behind. Why? They switched the teachers one year, they were looking at the same curriculum, why? The reason why is there was a commuter rail right outside the window. They went by all day long, constantly distracting the kids. They moved the kids to an empty room across the hall, and within two months, they had caught up and were at the same grade level as the other fourth grade classroom. So when you've got your little alerts on, beep, boop, I know why you have it on, because it actually stimulates the same part of your brain that, that causes addiction. Every time this thing buzzes, you're like, oop, somebody needs me. <laughs> Sale at Zappos, OK. And that's why you leave it on. You're afraid you're going to miss something. It's FOMO. You guys know that, right? Fear of missing out. You all have FOMO. And your phones keep it alive and well. The other thing that's interesting is make the stuff that you know is hard, or make the stuff that you know you shouldn't be doing hard. Make the stuff you should be doing easier. So there was this experiment that Google did. Google was looking at cutting some costs down uh, in their New York offices, and they always had M&Ms out. And so they were toying with the idea of putting less M&Ms out, and what they did instead is they put a lid on the jar, making it harder for some, I mean, it's not that hard, but just that one thing of reaching in and putting a lid in to make somebody stop and think, three million less M&Ms consumed at Google in one year. There are things that are obvious to do whether it's sleeping with your phone or having your phone on next to you, constantly alerting you, whatever it may be in the environment that you work in, that if you did small tweaks, you'd get a hell of a lot more done. So here's the problem, though. It's really not you. It's, it's about how your brain works. So let's talk about that. Your brain only has two modes. That's it. It's a super sophisticated processing machine that can take a look at an expression of your teenager coming down in the morning and say, oop, not talking to you right now. But it only has two modes. The first mode, this is the mode your brain loves. It's autopilot. How many of you have ever driven to work and you get there and you're like, oh, who drove the car? <laughs> you did. That was your brain on autopilot. The thing about autopilot is your brain loves to repeat the same thought processes because it doesn't have to work very hard. It's why you drive to work the same exact way every single day. And even when Waze tells you to try a different thing, you're like, nope, I'm going this way. It's why you have your coffee the same way every single day. Your brain does not want to work very hard. In fact, your entire life can start to look like this. 
You wake up, you get up, you walk into the bathroom, you brush your teeth, you go into the kitchen, you see the same people that you saw last night. You have one of maybe three breakfasts, the Greek yogurt, the cereal, or perhaps an oatmeal if it's getting colder. You then get in the car, you drive to work, you stop at the same place for coffee every single day, you order it the same exact way, except for maybe right now when you might start going to the pumpkin lattes. Then you get to work, you check Team Stream on Bleacher Report, you take a look at Facebook, you log into your email, you look at emails, you pretend to care, you show up at a meeting, you pretend to care, you check back on Facebook, text your partner, you check in with the kids, you attend a few more meetings, you make some phone calls, you look busy, you drive back home, you see the same people that you saw in the morning, you talk about the same stuff, you have one of maybe three dinners, take out Chinese pizza, maybe you make a chicken dish, you then turn on the TV, it's the same type of entertainment because now you're mainlining everything on Netflix, you go to bed, you turn to the person next to you, and he or she says, not tonight, I'm too tired. Same thing every single night. And your brain likes that, because it doesn't have to work very hard. Because the other mode that your brain works in is manual, and this is where you have to direct your thoughts. This is the moment when you want to get something done, when freaking Donald Sterling hits TMZ, and you've got to figure out how you're going to deal with this. When another player gets arrested, and you've got to figure out how am I going to deal with this. When you look at your returns for the year or your production run for the day and you're like, oh my God, are the markets are in crisis? How am I going to deal with this? Well, you're going to figure out what you stand for and what you want the outcome to be. And then you're going to have to use this to direct your thoughts. Because if you don't start directing your thoughts and telling yourself what to do, autopilot will take over. Roger Goodell was on autopilot during that press conference. Because the truth is, I'll tell you what he wants. He doesn't want to have to deal with this. He doesn't want these to be an issue. He wants us to blow over. He made that very clear. So why is it that it's hard for your brain? Well, there's some other things that you need to understand about what's sort of maxing your brain out by living in 2014. First of all, there's way too much choice these days, OK? You walk into the average supermarket, there's over 150 cereal choices in the average supermarket. It's no wonder you buy the same three. The reason why is the second that your mind starts thinking I have to analyze something, it's going to try to default you back to, man, or back to autopilot. They've done these studies in uh, financial markets where they take a look at, you know, when a, a uh, company offers like a 401k plan and they offer you a couple choices and they say, here's the selections we've made, but you can do whatever you want. Do you know 96% of the people take the selections that were made? Why? Because the brain would prefer to work on autopilot, and doing something on your own would require higher level processing. Too much choice leads to no choice at all. If you're interested in that subject, there's an excellent book by Dr. Barry Schwartz at the Harvard Medical School called The Paradox of Choice that just lays this all out. It's fascinating. Other thing, there's too much information. On average, and I would guess that in financial services it's more, the average American worker receives 173 emails a day. And as you know, you're spending 2.3 hours a day answering them. That's 83 days of your work year on just email. There's too many channels. There's 24-7 there's news. There's just so much information. And what does that do? Information that you have to process, it means your brain does not want to have to do any higher level thinking. Pace of life is too busy. Fear, risk, uncertainty. We peddle that at CNN. You guys tune in for it. But it also makes your brain want to go on autopilot. I suppose at some point you could just take one of these. I forget it all. There's another version of this slide, but I wasn't sure if I'd get in trouble if uh, I use that one. So here's the thing. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to trick your brain? So the interesting thing about your brain is that it uses the exact same strategy. Because what will happen is this. You'll be sitting at work and you'll say to yourself, you know, I really need to have that talk with, with my wife. I really do. I've been avoiding it for six months, but I really need to. And your brain's going to all of a sudden be like, uh-oh, uh-oh. Wait a minute. Michael just said that he's going to have that talk. Uh, we need to get him to stop doing that because we want him to just avoid the subject like he always does because it's much easier to be putsy about these kind of things because you know she's going to be a total raging, you know what about this, so don't do it. You know, I'm feeling a little alone. I'm feeling a little overwhelmed by that. I think I'll do it tomorrow. Or, you know, David is sitting at his computer and says, you know, I think I'm going to go to the gym tonight immediately. 
Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. David's having an idea to go to the gym tonight. Immediately, let's stop this right now. Somebody tell him he's tired. Tell him he's tired because then we'll get him on autopilot and go home, sit on the couch again and have a beer. Your brain uses feelings to screw you over. So let's talk about overwhelm because that's a big one. Overwhelm is nothing more than when your brain is full. So if you want to do any higher level thinking, you need a brain that is well rested and that's empty, OK? The problem is, as you go through life, it's filled up with all kinds of crap that you have to do and the to-do list that you need and things that you worry about and la, 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 la. And many of you start a to-do list every day. You finish two or three things, and then you use that as the beginning of the to-do list tomorrow. And the problem is, is that if you already have a full brain, and all of a sudden the phone rings, and it's somebody saying, hey, I need a report, and I need this, and I need that, and I need the other thing, and this, and that, and that, that's what happens. All those times you walk into the kitchen, you're like, well, why did I come in here? It's not dementia. You're not getting Alzheimer's. Your brain is full. And what you're going to do is whenever you feel overwhelmed, whenever you're in your, your work day or your life and you suddenly feel like, oh my God, I feel a little overwhelmed right now, or oh my God, I'm never going to get this stuff done, or oh, 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 you know, the drama associated with it. Super simple strategy. Take out a blank piece of paper, dump it all out. All of it. Just barf it out there like you got Ebola. Sorry, that was a bad joke. <laughs> Terrible joke. Can't believe I even just said that. Um, you're going to dump it all on a piece of paper. Everything from the song lyrics to the photo albums you got to finish to the present you got to pick up to this, that, the other thing to the PowerPoint. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you something. There's only two things on that freaking list that you actually need to do. And if somebody needs you, they'll call you. And if there's an emergency, you'll know about it. And at least now you got this. You got an empty head, so now you can do the higher level processing that you needed to do that you were trying to avoid. If you feel tired, use the governor's theory. I also call this Google earthing yourself. So scientists looked at how is it possible that somebody can ride the Tour de France? I mean, obviously their quadriceps are killing them and they're tired. It's because professional athletes can get above themselves and govern from above. You can do the same thing. What we say in the motivational speaking business is, you can feel tired when you're dead. Right now you got stuff to do. So if you start to notice that you got something that you need to finish, that you need to do, a conversation that you're avoiding, something that you're putting off and you feel tired, get up above yourself, remind yourself of what you stand for and what you want and push yourself forward. If you feel like doing it later, how many of you are procrastinators? Raise your hands, there's a lot of scientific people in here. Okay, good. So here's the thing about procrastination. You're not lazy. It's something else entirely. Procrastination is about control. You guys are insane control freaks. Totally. And we can't cure this. In fact, the only thing that you can do with a procrastinator is screw them over. Because procrastinators hold on to projects and put things off because, by God, nobody's telling you what to do. Not even you. And so by holding on to the project for a long time, you maintain control. And you're never going to change that because control is so awesome. So the only thing you can do is screw yourself over, and so that looks like this. If you constantly procrastinate on working out, you've got to find a friend that's picking you up. Because if they're standing in your kitchen, you're going. If you're meeting in there, you're not. You just screwed yourself over. If you constantly push off work deadlines, the only thing you can do is cut the project in half and promise half of it earlier. You just screwed yourself over. You're still going to pull an all-nighter and procrastinate on each half, but it'll just be less work each time. If you feel uncertain, so is anybody in here like an engineer or a programmer or an accountant or people kind of in that category suffer from this? You can't pick. And the reason why is you've been trained to noodle things down to such certainty that you are 100% paralyzed. So if you're the kind of person that finds yourself wondering, should I do this, should I do that, should I not, should I, ain't, 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 the problem isn't the idea, the problem is you never do anything. You must pick. Try it for a day or two, see how it feels, then pick again. Now, let's do this cool little trick. If you feel alone, the best thing in the world is the eye contact test. So I want everyone to turn to the person next to them. I know you're like, what? <laughs> what? This isn't church. <laughs> OK, who does not? I need everybody to have a partner. Who doesn't have a partner? Raise your hand so you can kind of turn rows. Somebody in the back? Yes. 
All right, this guy needs a partner. You gotta raise your hand. Who needs it? Who else? Raise your freaking hands. I will come out there. Do you, you do not have somebody, do you, sir? No, 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 you gotta have a pair. This is a pair thing. Oh, here we go, here we go. I got gotcha. you. Oh, no, you too. You got somebody to your right. What are you talking about? He needs the guy in there. What, you, what is wrong? He, you're gonna meet somebody, how about that? Okay, you two there, pair, you two there. Okay, anybody else not have this? Because it's a really cool exercise, I don't want you to miss it. And it only takes a second or two. So, during this, here are the rules. Absolutely no talking. None. You're gonna look into the eyes of the other person. No talking! And the per hold eye contact, and the person, God, you guys all have short hair. Okay, the person with the grayer hair, flash a big smile and hold eye contact. Go. <laughs> All right, let me explain what just happened. So the truth is, yes, you've been wondering if you have superpowers. The fact is you do. Okay, so what happened there? What, what was going on? What was going on is you just stimulated the other person's mirror neurons. So there are mirror neurons in your brain that are stimulated through sight. And if you look in somebody's eyes and you flash them a big smile, they can't, unless it's like a weird stalker smile, you know, they, <laughs> they can't help. Like their mirror neurons get charged. It's the same thing like if you see somebody cut themselves and you're like, <gasps> or you hear somebody say lice and you kind of want to scratch your head, like those are all your mirror neurons. So what I want you to do is I want you to do this little experiment along with the alarm clock test tomorrow. I didn't forget about that. What you're gonna do is you're gonna find just two people a day, that's it. You can be attracted to them, it's fine. <laughs> and what you're going to do is you're gonna find two people a day, you're gonna make eye contact, you're gonna smile, and you're gonna hold it, and you're gonna play a game with yourself where you get two strangers a day to smile back at me. Something interesting is gonna happen. Number one, you're gonna start getting a lot of free coffee. <laughs> Number two, what happens is you subconsciously fill the reservoir of confidence inside you. Because every time you make somebody pop and you switch somebody's mood, it actually comes back to you like, wow, I got this. Like I, I can really change the way that somebody is interacting with me. It is a hugely important thing to do for sales, hugely important thing to do just in life in general. And by the way, who you are right now will be totally different two weeks ago in terms of how you interact in meetings. You know where to sit in a meeting, right? In a conference table? Do you guys know where to sit in a conference room? No? You always sit in the middle. And the reason why is if you're sitting at the end, it's a dead zone. If you're sitting in the middle, you're always in the middle of the conversation. So if you have something to say, everyone's gonna see it. And if you're talking, everyone can see you and you're never closed off. It is the most powerful place to sit in a conference room. We have just a few more things to talk about, um, and then I'll take a few questions. But notice the thing that your brain always uses, feelings. It's the feelings that are screwing you over. It's the feelings that make you suddenly say, uh-uh, nope, no way, not gonna happen, no, uh-uh. Because the fact is, you're never gonna feel like it. Never. That's the universal law of, of change. You're never gonna feel like it. And think about it. In all the areas of your life that you're not happy, if you only did the things you don't feel like doing, you'd have everything you wanted. You know exactly what you're supposed to do. You just don't do it because you don't feel like it. It's a lot like having kids. My son never feels like putting his feet off the dashboard. He never feels like getting off the DS. My daughter never feels like cleaning up the Barbies. Why are they always naked? I don't, like this is, this I don't understand. <laughs> when you were a kid, what was your parents' job? It was to harass you into doing the things you didn't feel like doing. What kid ever feels like doing their homework? None. Feels like going outside to play? None. Turning off the computer? None. Looking adults in the eye, none. Using their manners, none. Eating their peas, none. Your job as a parent is to force those damn kids to do the things they don't feel like so they can get out there and make something of themselves. The problem is, when you turned 18 and you left, your parents didn't say, you are a stubborn son of a gun, good luck with yourself, because now it's your job. It's time to truly parent yourself, and here's how you do it. You use this thing called the five second rule. 
If you only take one thing away from this talk, take this. So we've talked about how to manage complexity. You can't manage the environment of it. You can't manage the chaos of it. You can only manage your response. What do you stand for? What do you want the outcome to be? We've talked about some best practices that you can utilize so that you're more effective in the day. And whether or not you follow them is entirely up to you winning the war in your brain. We've also talked about how modern life is screwing your brain over. And we've talked about things that you can do to unhinge yourself when you see yourself throwing yourself back into autopilot instead of doing the things you know you got to do. What you can deploy is the five second rule. And here's how it works. The five second rule is a nod to the fact that your mind is getting crunched all day long. And it's a nod to the fact that your brain will always make you go on autopilot unless you force it otherwise. So whenever you have a game changing idea, I should, I should really ask my boss for a raise. I should make 100 times the amount of money, not 100 times, 100% more than what I made this year. Or you 100 times, whatever you want. I should write that book I've been talking about forever. You only have five seconds before your brain is going to eat the idea. That's it. There's too much information, too much choice, too much fear and uncertainty, too much distraction at work, too many other things going on, too many things screaming for your attention. You got five seconds. So what do you do? All you have to do is take physical action, small, to yank it out of your head and ground it in the world. So that means if you, if you have an idea about something, say it out loud to somebody. Start walking. Today at the conference, this is another thing you can practice. You would be really dumb if you came to this conference and all you did was hang out with the people that you know. And the reason why is your network is the most important asset that you have, truly, in terms of how your career progresses and you know, what you end up doing in life. And there are people in this room, no joke, that either have the resources or have the connections or have the know-how to help you get whatever it is that you want. And if you show up at a conference like this and you stay with your little nucleus and you don't branch out, you are screwing yourself over. And I know, you don't feel like it. I don't feel like making small talk. I don't feel like meeting anybody new. You know you should. So here's how you're going to use the five second rule. As you are out and about, you know, tonight, you guys are going to King's, which is really fun, and you're going to have an open bar, and you've got all these sessions. As you scan the room and you see somebody who looks interesting, you have five seconds to do something about it. You have five seconds to literally be Start walking. That's it. Just start walking. I'm going to come right over to you. Hi, I'm Mel. Hey, Neil Crespi. Neil Crespi, everybody. Isn't he great? Give him a hand. <laughs> Thank you. Um, because if you don't do that, if you start walking, you're going. You're going. Then you make the eye contact. It's really weird to turn around, right? See, as I turn around on you. Hi, I'm Mel. Hi. What's your name? John Despotopoulos. John Despotopoulos? Yes. Wow, I got that. Okay, give him a hand, too. Thank you. So I want you to practice that because you will be shocked at just how weird you are. You're going to like be seeing people. You'll have the impulse to go walk over. Maybe you heard somebody speak on a panel and you want to give them your card. or You want to ask them some advice. You'll literally have that impulse to do something. You'll be like, uh, yeah, OK, I'll get a beer. I'm going to do this later. That was your brain putting you on autopilot. It happened that fast. So if you experiment with this today, you'll learn a lot about, God, I really do this to myself all the time. I'm going to leave you with a little science around how to make an instant connection so you can manipulate people. Um, first of all, proximity. There are some scientific reasons behind how you make an instant connection. Number one, proximity. It's why you should go to events like this, because it puts you in proximity with people that can help you or empower you or make you happier or expand your network or make you richer. So. They did a experiment, a very interesting one, at the police academy in Maryland. And what they did is they asked incoming cadets, so who's your buddy? And everybody said somebody different, right? All different kind of random people. They came back six months later. Who would you say your best friend is? Over 90% of the cadets named the person next to them in the alphabet. Why do you think that is? Because at a police academy, you sit in alphabetical order. You room in alphabetical order. You line up in alphabetical order. The proximity creates the opportunity to get to know somebody. They did, the same science, they did the same experiment with bench scientists and found the same thing. They did the same experiment with a dorm hallway, and you had a 64% chance of being best friends with the person in the, in the room next door or across the hall. 
You go one room down, it drops to 23%. The poor guy at the end of the hall, I mean, boy, are they out of luck. So the reason why going to events like this is important is because it puts you in proximity. It's also that phenomenon, how many of you, I, my husband and I have a 15, 14, and nine year old, and we're in that stage of life where our best friends are the parents of the kids that our friends hang out. Why is that? Because the proximity of sanding on the sidelines at a lacrosse game creates the opportunity to say, hey, you guys wanna uh, come on over for dinner tonight? Use the walking toward people. You know, or if there's a group, the other thing to do is a crab walk. So you got a group over here, just kind of step like a crab toward it, so then you're like sort of near it, and then as the thing, but then you go like, oh, hi, how are you guys? Um, number one rule, even if you're shy, be interested. So you meet somebody new, just be interested in them. Ask a lot of questions. There's a reason why you do this. The reason why you do it is twofold. Number one, it gets the spotlight off of you and puts the spotlight on the other person. And when somebody else is talking, they think you're really interesting. Ask anybody how the meeting went, and the person that did the most talking said, I think it went amazing. In fact, I think this speech is dynamite. But what also happens, if you ask people a lot of questions, is you start to learn things about them, and it creates the opportunity for what's called resonance. Resonance is that thing that you've all experienced where you've been sitting at a dinner party, you turn to the person next to you, you introduce yourself, and they say, oh yeah, I'm Sally from Ohio, and you're like, Ohio? My brother, sister, cousin's from Ohio. Oh my God, that's awesome. It's those connections of college or neighborhoods or what you do for a living or the ages of your kid that make you feel more connected to somebody else. And then finally, we taught you the eye contact game. And in terms of touch, you gotta watch this with other cultures, but the upper, uh, kind of right this area of the arm, if you touch that, it has been proven because it stimulates certain nerves here. You wanna do this in sales. Always shake the hand and do this. They immediately start trusting you. Just don't grab too hard, because then that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what you're gonna do. All, all you need to think about is, well, what is it that I want? In the morning, if you do nothing else, just lose the freaking phone. Do not sleep next to it next to your bed, please. Put it in the bathroom. Really important as you organize your day to think about the most important work in the morning. If you guys are taking photos of these, don't worry about it. I'll make, they can email this stuff to you. You can have it. Um, you're welcome to take photos, but seriously, I'll just give you the whole thing. Um, and get rid of the distractions. Another interesting thing, I read an article, uh, I think it was in the week, it was fascinating. The secret to leaving work at 5.30 is to plan your day to leave at work at 5.30. So when you walk in the office, you've blocked out everything with the plan to leave at 5.30. I know, you know all this stuff. I mean, I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. Meetings in the afternoon, the five second rule, a relaxing evening, which you'll have tonight, and if it doesn't work, you can always take one of these puppies. All right, any questions? <laughs>